Welcome to Armchair Preacher. Please open up your Bibles to 1 Peter 5. Last time, which was three weeks ago now actually, we covered the first four verses in 1 Peter 5. And so we're starting in verse 5. I've got notes on this page all the way to the end of the chapter. Um, but it's very little chance that we're actually going to cover all that today. That's the truth. Well, hey now. <laughs> so in the first verse, 1 Peter 5.1, it says the elders... So there's instruction to the elders. Verse 2, they're told to feed the flock of God. Verse 3, not to be lords over God's heritage. And then verse 4, it shows that they are under Jesus Christ. It says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall re receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And that's a capital S there. We went over chief. We went over good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd last time. So then verse 5 says, Likewise, so... Uh, verse 4 is the relationship between the elders and Jesus Christ, or the chief shepherd. And so then when it says likewise in verse 5, then we know what he's going to be talking about in verse 5 is similar to that relationship between the elders and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called the chief shepherd, but the elders are shepherds as well, because you see from verse 2, feed the flock of God. Well, whoever feeds the flock of God is the shepherd. He's the one that takes care of the flock. Uh, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Uh, so, although Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, the elders, we're talking about the elders, the leaders of the little flock of Israel, they are considered shepherds as well. And so then verse 5 says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So just like you would submit to, the elder would submit to Jesus Christ. It's saying that the, uh, the younger or the people who are not elders, they're part of the little flock of Israel, they are to submit themselves unto the elder. Now, uh, at the same time though, it's assuming that the elder does what they're supposed to do according to the instructions in the first four verses. You know, if, if the elder says, go worship the image of the beast, well, God has said that you'll burn forever in the lake of fire if you do that. So they shouldn't say, well, it says, younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, so I'm going to do that. Uh, they are still under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ primarily. And, and so the assumption there when you submit yourself is that the chief, uh, that the shepherds, the elders, are leading them in sound doctrine and in the word of God. Uh, rightly divided. If you look in Acts 5.29, uh, you can see an example because here you've got, in fact, starting verse 17, it says, Then the high priest rose up, this is Acts 5.17, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. And then in verse 28, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name, meaning in the name of Jesus? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter's response is in verse 29. He doesn't say, well, you're the elder because you're the high priest. You're over the, uh, you know, God, God did set those religious leaders over the flock of God. Uh, that's how he set up the structure there uh, when he gave the books of the law. Uh, when he called Israel to be his people, and set the Levites to be that priestly tribe. Uh, so he doesn't say, well, you know, the elder told me to uh, not to teach in Jesus' name, so I'm not going to do it. He says in verse 29, Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So keep in mind, when we're in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, when it says, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, that's assuming that the elder is doing what they're told there in verses 1 through 3. If they are not, if like that example, they say bow down, you know, they get money. For, they decide to, uh, they're an elder, they know that uh, the apostate Israel knows that the little flock is listening to what they say, and so they put pressure, the apostate Israel puts pressure on them, and let's say an elder caves in and decides to go ahead and bow down to the image of the beast. Uh, because they're giving money and they're threatened with their life if they don't do it. So then they tell the members of the little flock to bow down as well. Uh, then they should, the members of the little flock, 
should do what Peter did in Acts 5, 20, 29, saying we ought to obey God rather than men. I mention that because today, uh, it's the same thing. We're told today, our instruction in the dispensation of grace, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Uh, we do have elders, bishops, overseers um, over us as members of the body of Christ. And we're not told we'll just blindly follow whatever they say. And it's good to keep that in mind because that's what most of Christianity does. They don't follow God and His Word. They follow what man tells them. So that's why you've got these mega church preachers and they pretty much bow down to them and whatever they say. But we're told in 1 Corinthians 2.15 that he that is spiritual judgeth all things. We're told that we have the Holy Ghost as members of the body of Christ. He teaches us the things of God. We're not just mind-numb robots who listen to the preacher and just believe whatever he says no matter how crazy it is. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us that because we have the Holy Spirit, because we're in Christ, and we've got God's completed Word, it says to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. There are certainly some good teachers out there uh, that give some good doctrine, and even among the good ones, there will be some things that are said that are incorrect, uh, including myself. I include myself in there. I don't know what it is that I say that's incorrect. If I did, I would change it. But I'm not perfect. I'm going to say things that are wrong. And so you shouldn't listen to me and say, I believe it because Eric said it. The, your authority is God's Word. And since you have the Holy Ghost to allow you to judge all things, then you can prove those things according to God's Word. What I say, hold fast to that which is good or in line with God's Word, and the things that aren't, you can just discard. And that's the same thing for these uh, so that's you know something to keep in mind today because Christianity by and large doesn't follow God and His Word. They follow man. And so it's this, I'm sure it will be a similar problem with the little flock in the tribulation period. Those elders are there, they preach, and they tell them what to believe, and they uh, need to prove those things with the Scripture. As we'll see when we get down to uh, verse... Actually, the end of verse 5, we're going to see that the Holy Ghost is given to them as well, just like He is to us today. So when it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, the main thing there is the next part. It says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. The idea, the reason they are to submit, God sets up that structure, is to keep man humble. Uh, the greatest problem, I believe, that man has is his pride. For example, Satan, he fell because of pride. Look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. He's called Lucifer because that's how God created him. Uh, be that light for uh, light bearer there. And then uh, he became Satan or the deceiver once he iniquity was found in him. But look at what he does in Isaiah 14, verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and this is, so he says he's cut down to the ground. The reason that he's cut down to the ground, or the reason that he fell, is because of, he says, for, or because thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, or the angels there. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Satan exalted himself. And because of that, he was prideful and he fell. The little flock, remember, they're going to be there in the tribulation period. And the Antichrist is going to rule over their region for seven years, and the last three and a half years of that, he'll rule over the entire world. Look at uh, the Antichrist. He also, Daniel 11, verse 36, according to Daniel 11, 36, the Antichrist also fell because of pride. Daniel 11. Verse 36. And the king, that's a reference to the Antichrist, 
when he rises up, and the king shall do according to his will. It's exactly what Satan said. I will do this. I will do that. The Antichrist comes up and he's going according not to God's will, but to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So Satan's great fall is he says, I will, and he fell. The Antichrist, I believe, um, I don't think he's a saved person, he, I don't think he believes the gospel, but I do believe, based on what we know about him, uh, that he does see himself as a, you know, he's not, in other words, he's not trying to bring harm to anybody at first, is my, is just my personal belief from Scripture. I think he does think he's doing good. But what he does there in verse 36 and 37 is he does exactly what Satan did, is he goes according to his will. He magnifies himself above all others. And when he gets to that point, he does exactly what Lucifer did. Lucifer was great as the anointed cherub that covereth until iniquity was found in him until the pride and then he's been bad ever since same thing with the antichrist uh, he thinks he's doing good uh, he has good intentions but once he magnifies himself above everybody including gods god himself women everybody then uh, he's doing his own will and he's just like satan it's bad from that point out uh, so um but so you can see Satan fell because of pride. The Antichrist falls because of pride. Look at Revelation 13. So we saw in Daniel 11 how he is exalting himself. And look in Revelation 13 and verse 5 and see what the result of his pride is. Again, I say he starts as a, a guy who thinks he's doing good and has good intentions. But then when the pride comes in, he magnifies himself above everybody else, and then it's just like Satan. He's just as bad as Satan from then on. Revelation 13, 5, talking about the Antichrist. There was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. They say power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when you've got some this Antichrist here with his absolute power and his pride, following his own will rather than what God's will is, then he, the results is his blasphemy against God, blaspheming God's name, blaspheming God's ta uh, tabernacle. Uh, he even... Um, blasphemes the host of heaven. He's just completely corrupt, uh, just like Satan. And it's all, the point is, it's all because of pride. So, Adam, same thing, Genesis 3. You all know the story. The serpent tempted Eve, and she ends up taking the fruit because Satan said that if you eat of the fruit, you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. And she looks at the fruit, and she takes it. She says in verse 6, Genesis 3, 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. If she did not have pride, and she said, Well, God's commanded us not to eat of that tree. Um, yeah, I could be wise with that. I mean, why is it called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I must get knowledge if I eat of that. Uh, but apparently there's something bad about it. And so I'm going to trust God. I'm going to have faith in Him. And just submit to God and what He told me. And submit to my husband because He put my husband over me. And um, so I'm just not going to eat. That would have been the proper response. But if she looks at it and says, it's good for food, it's pleasant to the eyes, and it's desired to make one wise, she's completely ignoring God's will. And she's looking at herself and saying, 
I could eat of this. Sure, I break God's command, but that doesn't matter because that will be good for me. Now, I will be like God, knowing good and evil, because I eat of that tree. So, the fall of Satan, due to pride. The fall of the Antichrist, due to pride. The fall of Adam and Eve, due to pride. So, 1 Peter 5, it makes sense then that Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Because if they don't submit themselves, then they think they're better than everybody else, then it doesn't take long before they think that they're better than God, no better than God, don't believe the Bible, follow their own will, and just be a corrupt person going headed for the lake of fire um, afterward. Uh, if you go to Proverbs 16, I wrote on your outline that pride is a major issue for apostate Israel. The Proverbs, although they're, you know, all scripture is profitable, uh, primarily Proverbs is written for the little flock of Israel going through that tribulation period to have some wisdom to believe God and His Word over Satan and the lie program perpetrated by the Antichrist and apostate Israel. And look what Proverbs 16, 18 says. Very popular, you know, there are certain Proverbs that people know about and there are other ones that people don't have a clue about, you know. They've never heard like, uh, you know, Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than when a contentious and an angry woman. You'll never hear anybody from the pulpit read that one. Uh, you won't hear it, see that stitched on a pillow. Uh, probably because the woman would be stitching the pillow and she doesn't like that verse. Well, but, you, you won't hear it. You just don't see the men in church because if it's hunting season, they're in the wilderness <laughs> to get away from their wives. Yeah. Why else do you think men go out hunting <laughs> or mow the grass for hours? Yeah, there's a guy in our subdivision. He says, what, five? Somebody is out there mowing the grass for five hours and mowing other, uh, mowing other people's grass. Yeah. And you think, why did that? Well, they must not want to be inside. It's... It's 90 degrees with the heat index is 105, and yet they're out there for hours mowing the grass. It tells you something. <laughs> but the point is, um, certain verses are taken, and this is one of them, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And we've seen that. Satan fell because of pride. Antichrist falls because of pride. Adam fell because of pride. So, And then it says, verse 19, Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. It's better to have nothing in this world and to have faith in God than to have everything in this world and turn your back on God. And that's an important proverb for believing Israel to remember because that's the choice that they have to make. When the Antichrist controls the economic system and they can't buy or sell or have anything a process in that if they don't take the mark of the beast well they've given up their economic possessions and their basic food even uh, in order to believe God but if your attitude is I want to exalt myself I want to get ahead in this world then you end up falling because you stop having faith in God to take care of you and you start and spiritually speaking anyway uh, physically and spiritually for the little flock, but for us today, at least spiritually speaking. And and we're going to get to that when we get to verse 7 in 1 Peter 5. So you end up giving up on God and His will for you, and you do your own thing, and that's and the fall comes. Because now you don't have faith in God, and when you don't have faith in God, you've sinned. And that's a dangerous thing for the little flock. It's dangerous for us today as well. The main reason people never believe the gospel is because of pride. And even after they believe the gospel, the reason they don't believe Christ in you is because of pride. Uh, so it's certainly applicable today, but even more so for the little flock, because also tied to that, them, it's not just spiritual prosperity. Uh, the pride has, has to go with the material as well. Because if they don't have pride, then they don't care if they don't have the economic wealth. Whereas, I can trust God and have faith, at least right now, the way it works, and I can still hold down a job and take care of my family financially. The little flock won't be able to do that. It's an either-or choice. 
You either choose to believe God and His Word and lose all your worldly possessions, or you choose not to believe God and His Word and you can get rich in the, in the things of this world. So pride is even a bigger issue for Israel than it is for us today because of the tie into the economic system that they have. And actually, a lot of the world does have that same tie uh, today, but right now we're okay, at least in the United States. So pride is a major issue for apostate Israel. Uh, I wrote, because the sin nature is envious. Go over to James 4. <coughs> you see very similar language in James 4. In 1 Peter 5, 5, he says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So now let's read the James 4 passage. Again, written to the little flock for the tribulation period, and the message is very similar. Verse 5, James 4, 5. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Uh, we're going to get to that soon, but that's a quote of Genesis 6. There's the lusting to envy, verse 6, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Very similar to where we are in 1 Peter 5. Now go over to Genesis 6, because I mentioned, so God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, humble, uh, I mentioned that uh, James 4, 5, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. That's a quote of Genesis 6. And look at what was going on there. Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what the spirit that lusteth to envy is uh, a quote of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When you are prideful, when you're thinking of yourself above God and his will, then the result is you're going to cast away the thoughts of God and what you know about him, and you're only going to have evil thoughts and only follow those. It's significant that this verse is quoted from Genesis 6, because, as you know there in Genesis 6, the, the context is Noah. Because verse 8, Genesis 6, 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, remember what he said, God giveth grace to the humble, but he resisteth the proud. We saw that in 1 Peter 5. We saw that in James 4. So how did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? He was humble. He had these evil thoughts in his heart because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, according to Jeremiah 17, 9. But Noah says, I also know that God created me, that he is worthy of worship, and that I should not trust in my own righteousness because it says filthy rags. Therefore, I'm going to believe God and trust in him. I'm going to be humble and not exalt myself in pride above God and do what I want to do but I'm going to do what God has me to do. And the result then, because he was humble, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. A fulfillment of James 4 and 1 Peter 5. And it's great, and so you can see Noah as that example for the little flock. And it's a great example because the situation that the little flock in is in in the tribulation period is the same situation that Noah was in. Look over in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24 and verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus the question. It says, they asked him, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking about end time events. And the, the things that are mentioned here in Matthew 24 relate to that seven year tribulation period. And look at what Jesus says later on in Matthew 24. He says down in verse 37, 
But as the days of Noah, that's Noah, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. You know, those things are of the flesh. It's my pride. It's, I'm going to eat, I'm going to drink, I'm going to get married, I'm going to give in marriage. It's nothing about, what does God want me to do? How does God view these things? I'm a wretched man because of my wickedness in my heart. I'm going to have faith in God to save me. It's none of that. It's, I've got these thoughts that are evil, and I'm going to do those because I'm God. I'm prideful. I can do what I want to do. That's what happened in Genesis 6. And he says that these things happen until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Verse 39 now, Matthew 24, 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, took them away in judgment. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus Christ himself says that the world is going to be in a situation in the tribulation period. At the time of Jesus' second coming, it's going to be very similar to how the world was in the days of Noah. Noah, the thought of his heart was only evil continually, just like everybody else. The difference with Noah is he was humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Noah says, I'm a wretched man. I trust in God to save me. And God looks at him and says, Pride goeth before a fall, so everybody else on the earth I'm going to destroy because they're prideful. They don't have faith in me. But Noah... He has faith in me. God giveth grace to the humble. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So here's the little flock in the tribulation period where the whole world around them is just doing their own evil thoughts in their own pride. And so they need to be like Noah because God will give grace to the humble. They need to be humble. So you got that... Uh, so that's why he says, so going back to 1 Peter 5, 5, the reason he says, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, God sets up a structure within the church just so that you know that you're not God. Just so you know there's somebody in the church or some people that are called elders who know more about this than you do. And you shouldn't go up to them and say, well, who are you to judge me? Who are, judge not lest you be judged. I hear that all the time today. You know, we got to have tolerance. Where's the love of God? Instead of doing that, I say, I submit myself unto the leadership of the elder, providing that I don't have a clear indication from God's word that they are incorrect or that they're in false doctrine. And so I'm going to submit myself unto the elder. That helps me learn humility. So that when I come before the Antichrist and he says, bow down to that image of the beast or you're going to be killed. Then I'm not going to say, I want to exalt myself and so I'm going to bow down so I can become God and get all these riches and do good. Instead, I'm going to say, I've learned humility. I've learned that I'm not righteous on my own. And God has commanded me that if I bow down to that image. I'm going to have my place in the lake of fire for all eternity. Therefore, I'm going to have faith in God to save me, even though it may mean that I'm killed. Uh, so that elder uh, structure, the structure of the elder over the, the younger here, younger there, it doesn't mean, when you think of younger and elder, we naturally think of the elder is 70 years old, the younger is 30. We think of age. But here it's talking spiritually speaking. Because if you know 1 and 2 Timothy, Timothy was a young man. But yet he was over a lot of people who were older than him in the church. Yet he was an elder. Because it's talking about spiritual maturity here. You could have somebody who is spiritually mature, knows the sound doctrine very well, who's 20. Then you have somebody who's 70 years old, who just learned believe the gospel of the kingdom. That 70-year-old man, according to this, spiritually is younger than the 20-year-old man because it's, it's not an emphasis on physical age. It's an emphasis on spiritual maturity. So the 20-year-old the just happens to be more spiritually mature, so he's the elder. Just like Timothy was an elder over people who are physically older than him. So being younger there in verse 5 is in terms of spiritual maturity, 
they are to submit themselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So the way they humble themselves, I wrote on your outline, includes obeying God's word. Because remember, that's their final authority. If the elder tells them something different, contrary to God's word, they ought to obey God rather than men. So, uh, the way they humble themselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, is first, Scripture is their authority. And then, because God has set up elders over them, then they are to submit themselves to them. You notice from verse 3, we covered last time, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. We mentioned that in samples is an internal thing. It's they're showing forth God's charity, God's love, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, they're seeing uh, God living through them, the Holy Ghost living through them. And so they are in samples to the flock. They're showing what they should be doing internally. And so the way that the younger, spiritually speaking younger, humble themselves under the mighty hand of God is they recognize first God's word is, as their final authority. And then they're seeing the end samples of these elders who are also, verse 2, feeding the flock of God. So they're getting God's word. They're seeing God's word living through the elders. And so then they say, I'm going to submit myself to the authority of the elder, providing that it's in line with God's word. And by doing those two things, then they have uh, humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God. Then it says, that last part of that verse, that he may exalt you in due time. Due time, I wrote on your outline, is Jesus' second coming. We've already seen that in this chapter. The elder, in verses 1 through 3, is commanded to feed the flock of God, uh, not go after money, be in samples to the flock. And then it says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So the reward for the elders comes at Jesus' second coming, when the chief shepherd shall appear. That's Jesus Christ being the chief shepherd. Therefore, their reward comes at Jesus' second coming. So when 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Due time is the second coming. The Antichrist is ruling over the world um, in that tribulation period. And so he's not going to exalt them. They could, uh, God is not going to exalt them under there because the Antichrist is ruling. Power is given unto him, as we read uh, earlier in Revelation 13, uh, for him to speak these uh, great blasphemies for 40 and 2 months. So the due time isn't when Satan and his lie program is at its peak. The due time for them is when God overthrows them at the end of the tribulation period. Jesus Christ comes back. He sends his angels. Babylon is overthrown. Revelation 17 and 18 describes that. Uh, Jesus Christ will uh, gather up those who are against him, and there will be a great battle uh, in the valley. When Jesus comes back, he sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and then there's this battle under the authority of the dragon, which is Satan, the, the, um, the beast, which is the Antichrist, and then the false prophet as well. Those, that unholy trinity. And there's that battle and the Lord Jesus Christ destroys Satan's forces at that time. And then he resurrects the uh, little flock who's been killed. All the believing remnant in Israel's program, they're resurrected. All those who are still alive. And God takes all of those people, brings them into the kingdom. So just like the... Elders receive a crown of glory when the chief shepherd appears at Jesus' second coming. Then the younger, they are exalted or glorified, crown of glory for them, um, at Jesus' second coming. That would be due time. They can't expect it to happen now. You know, In today's world, you see that all the time. You want something, they want something, they want it right now. They wanted it yesterday. They can't wait. But God says, look over in Romans 5. And verse 3, God says, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. God says you need patience. Don't expect 
me to exalt you right now for obey, obeying me and submitting yourself under the mighty hand of God. You're going to be exalted in due time. Why do you have to wait? Because tribulation works patience. And then when you're patient, you have experience. And when you have experience, you have hope. And verse 5, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God is charity. You do not have agape, uh, the Greek word for love, uh, God's love. You do not have agape love or charity or the love of God until you've got hope. And you don't have hope until you have experience. And you don't have an experience until you have patience. And you don't have patience until you go through tribulations. So the little flock of Israel has to be refined by the tribulation period to build up these things so that the love of God comes through them. So that's why in 1 Peter 5, 6, they have to wait until Jesus' second coming before they're exalted. If they're exalted right away, they don't learn patience, and the love of God does not come through them. Next verse, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Um, I mentioned earlier about how if they don't take, about, uh, don't take the mark of the beast, they cannot participate in the economic system of the Antichrist. For us today, uh, depending on what time period you live in, what your government is like, uh, you may or may not have such an ultimatum. The government may kill you if you obey God and His Word. In most cases, they will not. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say most cases, but in some cases they will not. You can be a good citizen, law-abiding citizen, still believe God and His Word, and still take care of your family economically. Um, if you look over in 1 Timothy, in chapter 5, verse 8, for us today, this is what we are commanded to do today, because we don't have the Antichrist ruling over the whole world, threatening to take away all our economic resources if we don't take his mark and align ourselves with him and Satan. And so God says, 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So God doesn't tell us today to quit our jobs and trust in the Lord to provide for us because we don't have that ultimatum from the Antichrist telling us, take the mark of the beast or you lose all your wealth. In most cases, you can be a Christian and obey God's word and still provide for your family because the government isn't oppressive to that extent. Again, in most cases. But for the little flock in the tribulation period, it's different. The government is oppressive to that. So God says, when he says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. For them, uh, care is all things of the flesh, and it includes the basic necessities. Look over in Matthew 6. Matthew 6. I, and uh, Go ahead. Sorry, I just had a thought that um, if you think of a dictator, you know, there's still countries that have dictators. They're a form of the Antichrist, you yeah. know, you you pretty much have to do what the dictator says. You can't get food. I mean, you've got, I mean, look at North Korea. The majority of the people are in the government, you know, part of the soldiers, because that's the only way they can get food to feed their families. Mm -hmm. it's, I guarantee you, not every one of them want to be in the military. Right. You know, the North Korean military, it's basically, you have to do this or we're not going to, you know, you're not going to have any money, you won't have a place to live, you're not going to have any food, and that's pretty much what dictators are. They're a form of the Antichrist. Yeah, you can see a type of the Antichrist, that's a good point. Adolf Hitler is a great example. He killed Jews. Um, and then today, uh, Muslim countries... If you choose not to believe the Quran and you choose to believe God and His Word, uh, they could kill you for that, or they could take away your food. You maybe you're on the run. That's what believing Israel is going to have to do. 
He told them in Matthew 24 that when the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, in other words, when that image of the beast is set up because capital punishment is instituted at that time, he says, flee to the mountains. So you're fleeing for your very life. So when you see dictators like in Muslim countries or Adolf Hitler or other dictators, uh, you mentioned North Korea, uh, the communist ones in Russia, Stalin, Lenin, type, type people like that, uh, they are types of the Antichrist. They may not be that extreme to, here's an image, bow down, or you're dead, uh, but you can see types of what the Antichrist does in them. So, yeah, that's a good point. And so, uh, in that setting of the Antichrist, then casting all your care upon him, uh, for us today, it would be all things of the flesh as well. Uh, but because they're under that dictator, the Antichrist, and the food supply and water and all that's cut off from them, then that care includes the basic necessities. Matthew 6, verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Remember, they're on the run for their very lives. Um, the basic food, you know, if you, you may not think of getting a meal after you just ate a big meal, but when you start going four or five hours and you start getting hungry, six or seven, you're really getting hungry, eight or nine, ten hours, but you're thinking about that food and you want that food. Um, God says, don't take thought of that. And the reason, because you need the food to live, so, you know, and it's, it's a hunger pain, but he says, overcome that, don't think of that, because the more important thing is the Word of God. When Israel was in the wilderness... God gave them manna uh, six days a week, and uh, they could gather that up and eat just their daily portion. God fed them in the wilderness. They were to take no thought of what they shall eat. And the book of Deuteronomy says the reason that God did that is so that they may learn that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When you get to the point where you don't take thought of what you eat or drink, and you just trust in God for that, then you've learned physically what God wants you to learn spiritually is that the way you live, spiritually speaking, is not by the things of this world and following that and following what your flesh wants. It's following what God's Word says. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that's life. And you trust in that. And so God gives the little flock in the tribulation period he gave the ones 40 years in the wilderness. He gave them that example of God providing them the food, necessary food and drink, in order to learn the lesson that they need to trust in God's word over what man says. And so that's why he tells them, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal we be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Uh, again, that's, he's talking about both physically and spiritually. The Gentiles, uh, meaning all unbelievers, which would include apostate Israel as well. That's what they're worried about. That's why they align themselves with the Antichrist. It's not because the Antichrist is preaching truth. It's because the Antichrist says, you align with me, you'll have a high position in government. I'll give you wealth. I'll give you fame and wealth, and you can have whatever you want. And because they're seeking after the things of the world, they take that. But believing remnant, when they're told, if you don't bow down, you're not going to have anything, and I'm going to even take out your very life, well then, if they're not seeking after the things of the world, they will still have faith in God. He will give them eternal life. He will take care of them. So verse 32 there, After all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And you may think, what does that mean? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Uh, basically all it's saying is that the morrow, meaning the things of this world, is going to take thought for the things of itself. Uh, the world will continue to follow the lust of the flesh so that the economic system keeps going, is basically what it's saying. And the, the uh, economic, the, the way 
of the economic system there, it's sufficient unto today's the evil thereof. So the evil, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, that apostate Israel and the Antichrist are following, uh, it is a, the, the structure of the Antichrist Babylonian religious and economic system will allow the world to continue uh, the way it is. It's, in other words, it's sufficient. Um, the evil uh, that they have is sufficient to sustain the world for that time period. It's basically what it's saying. And so, since the world, in other words, the believing remnant, they're, what they should be thinking of is desiring uh, being in the kingdom. The meek shall inherit the earth. Have an eternal life with God in the kingdom. And so he says, well, don't take any thought of what you're going to eat or you're going to drink. In other words, you need to learn that your, your sustenance comes from every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. It doesn't come from the Antichrist and the things of this world. Well, the flesh lusts against the spirit and it tries to deceive you into following its will. So then the flesh says, well, I don't have food to eat. I need to... I need to be taken care of. So then it says, well, uh, you know, in verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Uh, God promises, verse 32, Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And verse 33, You seek the kingdom of God first, and then these things shall be added unto you. So your objection is, I don't have food, I don't have water, I don't have clothing. God says, don't worry about that, I'll take care of you. Well, then your flesh is going to come up with, because your flesh is always trying to get its will, and it's striving against your spirit. These are contrary one to the another, Galatians 5, 17. And your flesh is going to deceive you into thinking you're doing good. So it tries to deceive you by saying, you need to buy, take the mark of the beast so that you can have food and water. And God says, don't worry about that. I'll take care of you. I'll clothe you. I'll give you food. I'll give you water. And then your flesh then says, but the world is so bad. Remember, the flesh is, de is desperately wicked, so much so that it will take the good or God position to try to get you to follow its flesh. And so it's saying, this world is evil. It's so much against it. Um, it's not going to survive because it's so bad. And so God concludes the chapter by saying sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He's saying the world is not going to destroy itself in that limited tribulation period even though they're under the rule of pure evil under the Antichrist and him being under Satan. It's saying that the, the evilness of the Babylonian religious and economic system is sufficient to bring you unto the day which is the day of the Lord's coming. So it's sufficient unto the day of the Lord's coming. So the world will not pass away until Jesus Christ comes back and destroys it himself. So it's going against the flesh there. Now, having said all that, it doesn't mean that the little flock is going to get three square meals a day. They will be starving for food. In Matthew 25, uh, which... It's out of our context of 1 Peter 5, so I won't go over it, but Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, you can see that you have Gentiles helping out the believing remnant of Israel with food and clothing and water. But at the same time, they may not have what's sufficient in order to uh, not be sick. We saw in James 5, at the end of the book of James, how there could be some sick among them. In verse 14, is any sick among you? James 5.14. It doesn't say, well, then go take the mark of the beast so you can have food. It says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Remember, God's concern isn't with the physical, it's with the spiritual. A type of this tribulation period can be seen with the Lord Jesus Christ, who... Uh, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he had no food or drink for 40 days. And yet God sustained him. Um, even if God doesn't sustain them in the sense that uh, they are killed because many are going to be beheaded for not bowing down to the image of the beast. Um, 
even in that case, God is still going to raise them up, bring them into the kingdom. Uh, look over in Revelation 12, and you can see, because Revelation 12 is going to show you the spiritual care that God has for Israel during the tribulation period. You can see in verse 6, the woman fled. The woman here is a, a type of the believing remnant. So the woman fled into the wilderness. Wilderness, just like Jesus is in the wilderness 40 days, just like uh, Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. You've got the believing remnant of Israel in the wilderness for three and a half years. It says, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And then if you jump down to verse 14, the woman, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, that's three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So God promised to nourish them and to help them during those three and a half years. Physically speaking, yes, there will be some Gentiles who help them out. Uh, but they may uh, not have food to the point where they get sick. Well, then they anoint them with oil, and God says he will heal them. Uh, they may be beheaded. Uh, they could be killed. They could have an arm or a foot or, or a leg cut off or an eye plucked out. Mark uh, 9, I believe it is, talks about those things. For not bowing down to the image or not taking the mark of the beast. There could be some severe physical punishments of them. Uh, and yet God says he takes care of them because the most important is spiritually speaking. So when you go back to 1 Peter 5, 7, and it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Ultimately, that means the things of the flesh. I said care would be all the things of the flesh, food, clothing, and what will happen tomorrow, which is things that are mentioned in Matthew 6. That's why I mentioned those. The way God, my point on all this is the way God cares for them is He helps them spiritually, nourishes them spiritually. He may or may not do it physically, but He at least nourishes them spiritually because He wants them to learn the lesson that Jesus learned. Remember when Jesus came out of that 40 days and nights without eating or drinking, that when He was tempted by the devil, He says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's a lesson that Jesus learned not having, God, uh, not having food or drink for 40 days. If he had three square meals a day and was fine with that, um, he did not learn the lesson, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Because, I mean, he still may have trusted in God's word because he hadn't sinned, but the point is he didn't learn that man shall not live by bread alone because he never had to experience fasting. But the little flock will have to fast. Jesus Christ had to fast 40 days. People do that today. They'll take a fast. Oh, I'm going to go through a fast and um, serve the Lord that way. God doesn't have a fast. I think there is one fast day in, uh, in the Jewish calendar, if I'm not mistaken. I think there is one day. Uh, for the most part, though, God has feasts. He has seven feasts every year. Uh, he doesn't have the fast. The fast is what man does in their religion. Like I say, I think he does have one or two days of fasting. But for the most part, it's feasts. Um, that's what something man does to show his voluntary humility and how good he is. When the little flock has to fast and when Jesus has to fast, it's not, oh, I think I'll draw closer to God by not eating today or fasting a meal. It's, I can't get any food because I didn't take the mark of the beast. And Jesus learned the lesson 40 days and nights without eating that man does not live by bread alone because he survived 40 days without bread. He learned that he, he was to uh, learn, he learned that he survives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's the lesson for Israel to learn. So my point in all of that, I don't know, it may sound like a tangent, I don't know. But in 1 Peter 5, 7, 
when it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The little flock needs to recognize that God cares for them spiritually, first and foremost, because the spiritual is what will survive for all eternity, regardless of what happens to the body. Whether today you get eaten up with cancer and die early, you die in a car accident, or you live, like my grandmother, almost 106 years old. Either way, there will come a day when you go to the grave and that body that you had will do you absolutely no good. But your soul and your spirit will live forever. So God is concerned that you believe the gospel, you trust in Him, so that you may have eternal life with Him in His kingdom. And then He'll give you a new body. Since the body that we have today is temporal or temporary, we don't have to worry about that. And so when it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, most people think of, well, God's going to provide me the food, or provide me the water, provide me what I need. Physically speaking, that may or may not happen for the little flock. God is concerned with their spiritual maturity. If he gives them everything they need, physically speaking, then they may be prideful. Pride goeth before a fall then they start trusting in themselves rather than trusting in God. Unfortunately, God oftentimes has to take away the physical so that we will humble ourselves before God and learn that God will take care of us spiritually. So when the little flock is told to cast all your care upon him, basically it says, don't worry about your... You, you're on the run from the Antichrist. You can't buy food. You can't take care of your family because... The government has kept you from doing that unless you give your soul to the devil. So you don't want to do that, so you go on the run, and you may or may not have food. You may get sick. Uh, you may have to not go without food for many days. But God still cares for you. Cast your care upon Him. Instead of following the things of the world, believe God and His Word. Allow the Scripture to edify you so that when you are tempted to take the mark, bow down to the image of the beast, follow what uh, false doctrine says, then you're strengthened in the inner man, even though you may not be strengthened physically because you haven't eaten. And God is nourishing you, spiritually speaking, for that entire tribulation period, for the three and a half years that we've read about in Revelation 12, when the mark of the beast is instituted, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. So if they don't worry about the things of the world, then they won't fall to temptation, and then they'll spend their time in God's Word and being strengthened in the inner man so that they'll be stronger to endure until the end of the tribulation period and then they'll be better qualified to rule and reign with Christ in God's earthly eternal kingdom. So, um, the point is, he care, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. It's a verse that is stitched on a pillow, put on a... Um, put on a poster. It's a verse that people take out of context all the time and try to apply it today. And it does apply in the sense that we should not follow the things of the flesh, but it doesn't mean that if you quit your job, God's going to give you a meal and give you water and everything that you need physically speaking. In this dispensation, we're told, 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if you do not provide for yourself and your household, you are worse than an infidel and have denied the faith. So for us, that part is the opposite. For the little flock, they are to abandon their jobs and their wealth because they're forced to in order to have faith with God. Uh, so in their case, they are to rely upon food and clothing and water from God himself. And that's only so that they will learn the lesson that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay, so now... Uh, let's go, we're going to cover verse 8, and then we'll stop for today. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, they are told earlier in 1 Peter, they're told in Matthew 24, they're told in several places that they are to watch. If they watch for... You know, go back to 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And so when 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Be sober means, yeah, not physically drunk, I understand that. But more importantly, not spiritually drunk. 
Being sober means clear, level-headed, reasonable thinking based upon God's Word and the doctrine found on there as the Holy Ghost has taught them. And they're vigilant. They're watching. They're looking for the signs of the end. They're looking for what's the reason behind this. The Antichrist says he's going to take care of the world. Well, how is he going to do it? And why does he do it that way? And then you look at what's going on and you see the signs around you. So for them in the tribulation period, they need to look at the spiritual significance behind everything that happens because the adversary, the devil, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, so if they were watching for those things, I wrote on your outline, and the devil roars, he will not be able to catch them. You notice uh, he's called a roaring lion. If he's a lion that, you know, a lion can just take you up in its, in its jaw and eat you. Uh, but if, it's, if a lion is hiding in a bush and you walk by the bush, you have no idea it's there. It can just jump out there and kill you. But notice the devil is not a hiding lion. He's not a quiet lion. He's a roaring lion and he's walking about. If he's, if he's a roaring lion, you can hear him from a great distance. I think, I, I don't remember exactly, but I've heard where you see these nature specials. I think you can hear a lion for a couple miles, you know, a loud roar of a lion. So you hear the roaring lion and he's walking about. So if he's roaring and he's walking about, that means you can see him. And spiritually speaking, they can see what the devil is doing. If they're sober, if they're vigilant, if they've got sound doctrine built up in the inner man, then they will see what the Antichrist and apostate Israel and all that does. They will see that as a roaring lion. A roaring lion, if all it does is roar, it can't do anything to you. It could scare you. You can run from it. You can be afraid. But if you know that that lion cannot devour you, then there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of. A roarer is a scare tactic. And that's what the devil does through the Babylonian religious system. The devil is not able to destroy the souls of the little flock. He can kill the body, but he can't destroy the soul. And so his threat, even up to killing the body, is just a roar. Because regardless of what he does, as long as the little flock has faith in the gospel of the kingdom and the mystery doctrine uh, that God has given them for, of the kingdom for the end times there, the, when the kingdom is at hand, as long as their faith is in that doctrine, God will resurrect them. He will give them eternal life in the kingdom. And there's nothing that the devil can do about it. So that's why he's described as a roaring lion. And if he's a roaring lion and he's walking about and you're sober and you're vigilant, then you're going to notice what he's doing and you're not going to be uh, devoured by him. You're not going to, you'll be able to stay away from him. But, as we know, a lot of people are not perfect. So even if, he, I wrote on your outline, that even if he does catch them, the Lord will deliver them by faith. Look over in Matthew 25. There is the example of the ten virgins uh, and five of them are wise with oil in their lamps, and the other five are not wise. They don't have the oil. And it's a type, the oil is a type of the Holy Ghost. It shows that five uh, believe the gospel of the kingdom throughout the tribulation period. The other five do not. But you notice Matthew 25, verse 5, it says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So all ten virgins, the wise and the unwise, all slumbered and slept. Spiritually speaking, those ten virgins are in the mouth of the lion. Now the little flock, it says in verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Well, that's the little flock crying. If they're crying, they were watching, so they knew the second coming was there. So that means they were not sleeping. So these are people who, the little flock, these are people who are sober and they're vigilant and they've noticed the devil with the roaring lion and they say, Jesus' second coming, better get ready. And they speak to those who are sleeping. So they are in the mouth, spiritually speaking, they are in the mouth of that roaring lion, the devil, because they were not sober, they were not vigilant, and they fell down to what... Um, 
Satan and his program was doing through the Antichrist. But you notice, uh, verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So here's a case of all these slumbering and sleeping, sleeping, they're all in the mouth of the lion. But yet five of them, because they had oil, or in other words, they had faith in the gospel of the kingdom, they still made it in the kingdom, even though they were in the mouth of the lion. By contrast, the other five, because they did not believe the gospel of the kingdom, they did not make it into the kingdom. Uh, but it shows, first and foremost, you want to be part of that little flock that is sober and vigilant, so that when the roaring lion comes, you don't even get in his mouth, and you know, here's the second coming. Because without that group of people watching, then there wouldn't be a group to warn the people who are sleeping, and then they would continue to sleep. So in other words, for all Israel to be saved, Ideally, they all need to be part of this little flock to warn the other ones who are not part of that flock so that they may be saved at the end, so that they may believe the gospel of the kingdom. So even if he does catch them, is my point, the Lord will deliver them by faith. Look over in 2 Timothy 4. Uh, look at what Paul says. This is at the very end of his life. 4.17 417, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. This is a guy, Paul, who, as a religious Pharisee, was headed for hell. He was in the mouth of the lion. And in Acts 9, the Lord Jesus Christ saw him from heaven and said, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? And uh, the gospel is preached unto him, and he believes. He was in the mouth of the lion. He was following apostate Israel, but God delivered him out of the mouth of the lion because he had faith in the message that God gave him. Similarly, for those five virgins who were wise, they were wise in that they believed the gospel of the kingdom, but then they got distracted by the cares of this world, and they were asleep. They were in the mouth of the lion. And God, through the ministry of the little flock who was watching and was sober and was vigilant, they were able to be delivered because they believed the gospel at the end. They were delivered by faith. And the type of this is all seen in Daniel chapter 6. Uh, don't forget that the Old Testament is not just a bunch of neat stories that you tell your kids. They're, while they are true and they literally did happen, they are also types and they have spiritual lessons there. And so in this case, Daniel... Uh, we probably all know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel 6, uh, there's a rule made that you can only worship the king. And Daniel goes against that rule, and he obeys the Lord, the law of, of God. And the result is, he is captured, and he's thrown into the den of the lions. And then if you go down, let's see, to verse... Uh, Verse 16, Daniel 6, 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Uh, you know, promise of uh, deliverance like we've seen with Paul, like we've seen with the little flock in 1 Peter 5. But here's Daniel cast into the den of lions. And then if you go down to verse 21, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. Spiritually speaking, this is exactly what happens to Israel in the tribulation period. They are cast into the lion's den. The chief lion, Satan himself, roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And if they're sober and they're vigilant, they're in that lion's den, they know where he is. They hear him. 
They know what he's going to do, spiritually speaking, because God said in his word exactly what he's going to do. And so they don't fall for any of his tricks. And because of that, they don't go into the mouth of the lion. But even if they do lose faith, not believe the gospel of the kingdom, and they are in the mouth of the lion, that lion does not actually destroy them, spiritually speaking, until the second coming. And so there's still a believing remnant that are sober and vigilant and watching that can warn them and wake them up from their slumber. And then they believe the gospel of the kingdom and the Lord will deliver them from the mouth of the lion. You notice Daniel, he doesn't say, he says, he has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. Um, he, it sounds like that he was sober and vigilant and the lion never actually, he was never actually in the mouth of the lion. Uh, but even if he was, uh, the Lord kept him from being hurt by the lion. The lion's mouth did not crush him. The point is, God delivered him from the lion's den. Spiritually speaking, that's what the Lord does for the little flock of Israel. So what he says, 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil cannot destroy the souls of Israel. And they've got a type of that with Daniel in the lion's den. All right, we're out of time, so we'll close there. We'll pick up in verse 9 next, next time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for your word. And as we see in the tribulation period, there is great resistance from family members, from people in religion, from... Uh, just most of the world itself and Satan and his program to keep them from believing God and his word. But yet you've poured out your Holy Spirit upon them and you've given them your word, you've given them elders, you've given them a way for them to believe your word and to be spiritually strong. Uh, help us to do the same thing today, knowing that we have the Holy Ghost, God's word, uh, and we can prove all things that people say and hold fast that which is good so that we may be strengthened with might in the inner man and be delivered from that roaring lion of Satan, not yielding to his temptation by being sober and being vigilant. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. Next time we'll pick up in 1 Peter 5.9. So we'll see you then.